Um, yeah, so uh, just by way of brief introduction, um, I think I know some of you, um, but you may not know me uh, or Critical Resource, the company I work for. Um, Critical Resource is a London-based advisory firm. We specialise in advising senior executives and C-suites on a whole host of political, sustainability and stakeholder issues at both the group and asset level. Um, we specialise in the mining, oil and gas sectors and we work all around the world, um, anywhere where there are resource projects uh, that face uh, stakeholder and political issues, which is um, more or less everywhere. Um, we work very closely with networks of advisors in the countries where we operate and we also uh, will have a senior advisory panel um, and network which at the top level features kind of eminent industry figures of the likes of Chad Holiday, Chair of Shell, uh, Simon Thompson, Chair of Rio Tinto and, and others like that. Um, but in terms of our daily, daily work, uh, we draw very heavily on the expertise of uh, people who spent many years um, in the industry on the front line dealing with the kinds of issues that we advise on. Um, we are now a very proud to be part of the ERM group. So I think we have our colleague Sam Priest um, of ERM here, which is a leading global sustainability consultancy. Um, we've been working in Mauritania for a long time now, and um, we are very proud members of the MBBC as well. So very pleased to be uh, hosting the first webinar um, in this new normal that we that we all find ourselves in. So yeah, as Matt said, um, when we were looking at what kind of a topic uh, we wanted to go for, for for this webinar, we thought it'd be quite an apt time to kind of take stock and look at where we are uh, one year on into President Gazwani's um, reign. Clearly uh, this time last year and you know 18 months ago as well, uh, there are a lot of big questions um, and a lot of uncertainty about how the next uh, year or so and how the transition would unfold for, for Mauritania and um, how it would play out. I think in many ways we, we have uh, a lot of answers now, um, but uh, equally uh, I think uh, there are a lot of big questions remaining and, and, and next year will be um, almost as, as much of an important year for Mauritania as, as the past year has been. So hopefully uh, yeah, with this we'll kind of look back over the past year, but also be a little bit forward looking as well. Um, Totally, when I put this together, I look back at some slides I put together for a presentation about a year ago, uh, which I think said something along the lines of, uh, with Gazwani as the appointed successor, uh, we look to be on track for a smooth handover, which I think, you know, um, I, someone clearly argue against this on the kind of day-to-day um, uh, -day level, but overall, I think uh, it has been uh, a smooth handover um, and, and in some ways smoother than except, expected. We obviously had a lot of concerns um, about some kind of a backlash from Aziz or, or a comeback bid. Uh, I think, um, you know, it was clear kind of from, from the way that he ran the country that he wasn't necessarily going to step back gracefully from power. Um, and in many ways, uh, you know, that, that was the case. He, he didn't uh, really just kind of fade off into the background. And if we look at the kind of three scenarios that we had outlined um, before the kind of the elections and, and the handover for how this might play out. We had uh, the one first one, which would be around power sharing in which Gazwani and Aziz uh, adopt kind of Putin Medvedev arrangement um, where they very much share power. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, um, kind of more of a outright battle for power between the two men. And then a kind of middle road where uh, they muddle through and Gazwani over time slowly consolidates his position and builds his power base. Um, I think uh, we in some ways skipped straight to kind of lopsided form of the, of the second one um, in which Aziz did make a, a comeback bid and did seek to challenge Gazwani's authority quite, quite quickly. Um, and that in some ways provoked Gazwani to, to give a bit more of an assertive response. Um, and I think that that uh, development meant that we actually didn't see some of the, the things we had thought we might, um, things like a snap election or some kind of rebranding of the UPR, um, because in many ways the, the move kind of forced a bit of a, uh, a snap election within the UPR in that, you know, uh, they were forced to come out in favour of one or the other and, and resoundingly came out um, behind uh, Gazwani. And I think that kind of course of events has largely negated as well a more Putin Medvedev uh, scenario where if say uh, Aziz had kind of come back from his his few months touring Europe um, after the elections and came out in support of Gazwani and accepted some kind of figurehead role somewhere else 
uh, within Mauritania or in an international uh, body, as, as some people have been talking about. It, it would have uh, kind of offered an option for him to bide his time and eventually, you know, plot his way back to some some kind of more um, prominent role in politics in the future. But I think because he has now, it's been so clear, uh, really the extent to which his kind of support base has just melted away um, and that the country has got behind um, Gazwani, that that no longer really remains um, an option for him. Um, and I think a second kind of uh, theme that we had been following was around this idea that Aziz had ruled the country with quite a heavy hand and, and you know, in some ways quite a kind of a, an iron fist. And that, you know, Gazwani has come in with more uh, open style, much more diplomatic, much more reserved. Um, and there was a sense that this might have been interpreted by some as a sign of weakness or that, you know, after all the, these years of the Zion grip, um, people would sense kind of a loosening and, uh, and this would lead people to position themselves to, to kind of oppose or challenge Gazwani. I think that's another thing that we haven't really seen happen yet, um, partly because Gazwani has been very strong in kind of signalling continuity, um, but also because he has... Uh, in his own kind of relatively quiet way, uh, quite strongly reasserted some of the, the red lines and made it clear that, you know, he's not coming in and suddenly going to open everything up entirely. And then the kind of third point that I wanted to make was around uh, COVID-19 and, and just kind of the, the situation on the ground. I think going into the elections, you know, everyone's clearly very aware that, you know, Mauritania just faces huge challenges um, and, and any incoming president would, would do um, in that position. I think one of the risks we had seen is that uh, a lot of political instability would further kind of delay any any efforts to address those. And clearly, much of the year has been dominated by uh, you know politics and the Aziz comeback and things like that. But I don't really think that it goes beyond what we might have expected. Um, I think clearly what has come out that none of us anywhere in the world uh, really saw coming uh, this time last year is the, the COVID-19 crisis. Mauritania I think, now entered into more of a phase as many other countries of learning to kind of live with, with a new normal in which uh, COVID is something that needs to be managed as much or as, as kind of, yeah, little as, as is possible, uh, given the kind of uh, resourcing restraints and, and other factors. And we've been kind of come out the other end of the initial perhaps uh, early optimism that Mauritania would be in some ways spared through the kind of panic that that clearly wasn't entirely the case. Um, and now there has been some lifting of the internal travel restrictions and, and things like that. I think uh, that's one where it's quite an unknown for how this will evolve in the coming months. Um, there are some concerns around the Kind of movement of people out of Nouakchott and other urban centres to rural areas uh, as part of the holidays and also to help with the harvest uh, that we'll see in the coming months and, and what that will do in terms of the case numbers and whether there'll be a resurgence. Um, but that's certainly one thing we, we weren't really expecting and, and it's still quite unclear. And then I wanted to take a look at kind of, uh, so we have Gazwani in place now uh, as a leader, clearly a different person to Aziz, um, and kind of consider, you know, what, what is different under Gazwani as president and, and what has remained the same uh, despite the, the transition and the handover of power. I think one thing that's clear is that the political climate has in some ways um, become much less conflictual. Uh, there's no longer this sense uh, that we had under Aziz that, you know, the opposition is seen as some kind of enemy of the state. Um, and that Kazwani has clearly come in with quite a strong kind of stance on being more open in style towards the opposition. I don't really think we're yet seeing that translate into a, a lot of substance or kind of significant concessions. Um, the opposition does, does seem to remain quite a, a marginal force as continues to be quite fragmented. Um, and I think what, what we haven't really seen yet is any real kind of unifying leader or coalition platform that would bring together um, what has been quite, what is quite a kind of disparate um, set of uh, causes espoused by opposition leaders. Um, another big change, I think, has been um, kind of an increase in, in delegation of decision making authority to ministers. Um, again, whereas under Aziz, it was very much kind of micromanagement of, of individual cases and, and um, the, uh, ministers not really having a lot of like room for manoeuvre. Um, Gazwani has taken a noticeably 
more hands off approach. Um, but we have seen him keep quite a close eye on strategic dossiers. He's placed a key loyalist and ally, uh, General Hanena, uh, as Minister of Defence. Um, and so I think that that's one kind of area where we, we've seen some movement, but uh, not a complete uh, change. Um, and I think another point on that is that with, with all the talk that we've had of a reshuffle uh, in recent months, um, we kind of are seeing that, you know, for the most part, politi- uh, ministers do remain uh, relatively kind of politically um, disposable. I think the, the kind of talk of the reshuffle has been linked both to kind of catering to this pressure for change, uh, linked to uh, Abdulaziz and the corruption investigations, which we can come on to uh, later. But it's also very much uh, around this potential need to kind of um, mitigate pressure on the government for any perceived shortcomings in the COVID response. Um, and then an area that I think uh, we see a lot of continuity um, is with international relations. Um, I think there's been an improvement in kind of uh, rapport with certain international partners, uh, particularly, for example, Maki Sal. Um, whereas with others, uh, maybe it's taken a little longer to kind of warm things up with Gazwani for, for those who were very close with Aziz. Um, but broadly speaking, I think uh, that's that's an area where Gazwani has made efforts to kind of reassure partners that he's not going to come in and, and really change everything overnight. Um, and, and the you know, key areas like France also uh, are going to remain kind of important partners for, for Mauritania. And the same goes for the Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which I think have been very much partners that Mauritania has been looking to um, in this kind of time of need around the COVID crisis. And then in terms of uh, policy agenda and, and kind of realities on the ground as well, I think uh, there hasn't really been uh, much of a change. I think defence will remain a priority. Um, it will likely continue to kind of place a burden on um, state resources, particularly given, in, given the deteriorating uh, regional situation and we had the G5 summit hosted by Noakshot not long ago. And then of course we've had this kind of flagship anti-poverty agenda announced by Gazwani, um, which uh, you know you could argue he's only had a year, It's not we're not really at the stage yet where we would be seeing uh, either kind of full rollout of that or any material uh, impact to the situation on the ground. Um, so I think that is one area where you know there hasn't really been any change, and particularly with the COVID crisis, it, it's not something that we can uh, really expect to see significant progress um, on in in the coming year. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, again, looking back at where we were, kind of 18 months a year ago, there were so many uh, questions, so much intrigue around uh, Gazwani and kind of who he is as a person, uh, what he will be would be like as a leader. Um, and as I was saying before, I think we, you know, we do have a lot of those answers now. I think 2021, um, kind of even just the autumn of this year will be a, a key period. Um, but to, to kind of recap on some of the things that I think we do know so far. Firstly, Gazwani appears to be broadly uh, an effective political operator. Um, when he kind of was appointed as, as Aziz's uh, successor, you know, he was this very enigmatic military figure. No one really knew much about him. Everyone was wondering, you know, how will he fare in a more political role? Um, and I think from you know from what we hear, uh, it's clear he's not kind of a very engaging, charismatic orator. Um, but in his own kind of cautious way, uh, he has effectively steered Mauritania through you know what has been a huge transition and a, a very fragile one um, at that. And he's he seems to do a good job so far of kind of balancing off a lot of competing interests and and constituencies and groups. Um, and has proven to be, you know, really quite a shrewd political operator. Um, I think that's, you know, we'll have to see how that uh, goes for him and, and as he, you know, develops further into his role uh, as president and the, the pressures on him evolve. Um, as we said before, I think he uh, clearly will rule in a more open manner in some ways, in a much more kind of diplomatic um, style than, than Aziz did, um, but equally will remain kind of uh, committed to some of the most important red lines for the regime and will keep uh, the country broadly on, tack, on track in, in terms of the kind of policy agenda with, with that uh, greater focus on anti-poverty and, and also reforming the education system. Um, and then I put this last one in here uh, about him drawing on the elite for key positions because uh, to me it seemed very much that a year ago again one of those real kind of topics of intrigue were was 
who are Gazwani's men? Who, who are the people who he will bring in and who he'll rely on? You know, will he sweep you know, kind of out with the old, in with the new? Um, and I think we do we do have a, a lot of answers there. Um, you know, he's in some ways drawn on the people who were already there, who kind of knew the, the lay of the land and um, were part of the Abdul Aziz era. Um, and Veta is, of course, a notable example there. Um, Equally, he's brought in some of his own people, his kind of long-standing, long-standing allies and, and the people he trusts trust, uh, very much. We mentioned General Hanena earlier, um, and I think also uh, the chief of staff of the presidency, uh, Mohammed Ulamin, who's a childhood friend of his and, and clearly a very trusted advisor, is, is another example there. And then I think more broadly, uh, the answer is, you know, he's kind of, uh, particularly in his cabinet of appointments, focused on finding people with relevant qualifications and uh, kind of experience for, for the role in question. So signaling kind of, or at least starting to signal competence there and, and just draw on kind of, you know, the pool that is available to him. So I think that's um, uh, some of the kind of key answers uh, that at least to a certain extent I feel we have so far. But uh, looking forward, I think there are a lot of big questions uh, that remain. Uh, the first one, clearly, and this is not only the case for Mauritania, but for probably nearly all political leaders in the world at the moment, um, is how will this COVID crisis play out for him? The government, um, I think they, you know, they, they're kind of accepting that there's uh, there's so much they can do on the health impacts, um, and then there, there's the economic impacts that will uh, clearly need to be addressed. Um, and even though in some ways uh, Mauritania has fared better than, than other countries and, you know, it has been able to continue exporting iron ore, gold, things like that during this period, there will be economic impacts. And uh, the population is very frustrated already. It's, you know, under great strain because of the situation. And I think what uh, remains to be seen is how that will play out for Gazwani um, and, and indeed for the country more broadly. Um, I think another kind of big uh, ongoing topic will be uh, how he manages to kind of effectively manage demands for accountability uh, for Aziz and for the kind of uh, acts of corruption under the, the previous regime. Um, the corruption investigations are ongoing at the moment. The Parliamentary Investigative Committee is due to present its report to, to the Parliament in the coming weeks. Um, and so I think there's still some kind of uh, run to go in that really there's it, it's picked up quite a bit of momentum um and it seems that so far you know Gazwani has let it run um, and it hasn't uh, given clear indications of kind of escalating uh dangerously or, or in, a, in a way that we would see impacting kind of stability uh, but nonetheless it, it's something to keep an eye on it's clearly been a very politicized process and there are um, influential people um including by, by some accounts people like Buamatu who come back to the country who are seeking to kind of, you know, use it for their own ends. So I think it is one that Gazwani will need to keep an eye on and, and continue to kind of manage effectively. And then two, two last questions I think that I would imagine uh, will be important for members of the business community, which is um, will Gazwani have kind of sufficient willpower and um, importantly kind of the ability to, to tackle uh, some of the corruption that we're, you know, seeing increasing signs is, is uh, really a serious issue. Um, going forward, I think, you know, that one thing is the political will to do that and uh, the ability to do so, particularly um, given that going forward, he, he will need to continue to kind of balance competing pressures. There are a lot of people who are coming up who will be eager for opportunities um, and, you know, their chance under the new regime. Um, and he'll be doing that in, in a kind of post-COVID economy. Um, so I think that will be quite a challenge for him. And then uh, also a, a kind of a lower level, just capacity constraints and actually implementing any anti-corruption measures um, in the kind of day-to-day -day running of, of government. And then a uh, final point, kind of looking at perhaps the broader picture, um, is uh, to what extent Mauritania will be successful in in. Uh, kind of improving um, and building its reputation as an investment destination. Clearly, we're in a much more competitive marketplace for foreign investment at the moment, post-COVID, um, and with post kind of a low oil price uh, crash, um, and with you know greater attention on things like the energy transition and and um, 
exploration and activity in the future of that when it comes to the oil sector and, and the delay to GTA. Um, so I think we've seen some countries like Senegal, you know, very proactive um, in uh, making sure that they can do everything possible to maintain uh, kind of the interest of foreign investors in this climate. Um, and I don't think we really have yet seen uh, Mauritania kind of focusing on that in the same way. They've not been quite so quick on the blocks. Um, so I think that's another question um, in my mind going forward is how how will that evolve um, and how will that play out kind of on, on both sides, both from investors and um, from Mauritania's side. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a whistle top whistle stop tour of uh, the past year from me. Um, I don't know if anyone has any any further uh, points that they think are either knowns or known unknowns, uh, and or happy to take any any questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting. The uh, one of the questions that's on my mind the. Um, Corruption investigation that uh, that you talked about. What what's the what do you see as the the driver behind it? Is this um, an intention to improve governance and be seen to improve governance and 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 maybe a link to the attractiveness to foreign investment that you mentioned just at the end, um, or is this the the new guard sort of putting the old guard in their place in some way? What, what do you see as the motivation behind it? Um, I kind of I see it as a combination of different things. I think um, I think Gazwani is aware of this a need for you know uh, people perceived to be involved in past crimes to be held to account for there to be that kind of accountability, um, and you know that is why he has kind of you know let the the parliamentary committee operate quite independently. Um, but I do think that Aziz made a lot of enemies uh, during his, his time in office and there are a lot of people who have an axe to grind. Uh, and so there are both people who were kind of that feel that they were wronged by Gazwani, uh, by Aziz, sorry, and are very, very keen for him to be held to account for that um, and to kind of stand trial publicly and, and answer for, for his crimes, the ways in which he's wronged them. Um, but then equally, there there is... Um, rivalry in in the new administration and you know there aren't that many positions to go around and many of them are very kind of hotly contested and, and coveted and i think what we have seen uh, to a certain extent is people who may be after certain jobs and i think this has been the case for for Veta, for example um kind of seeking to use these investigations as a means of uh discrediting rivals and and creating opportunities for themselves um, so I think it's been quite a kind of uh, a melee of, of lots of different things um, that has uh, really shown the extent to which everyone's kind of turning against disease and, and kind of finger pointing at him. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. For the presentation. Very interesting. Um, the, the last time I attended a, something a little bit similar to this was um, on the subject of Mauritania was probably about two years ago. And um, one of the... Uh, topics that was mentioned then was that Mauritania was trying to um, carve a space for itself in sort of northwest Africa as a as a little bit of a um, an area sort of oasis of, of peace and stability as compared to um, Mali and Niger and some of the other countries um, inland and that they were investing in that sort of um, opening up to um, NGOs and uh, other Possibly government um, organisations from from outside that might want to have a base in the in northwest Africa. Um, is is there any sign of that, or was that um, an idea that's disappeared, or is it something that's still part of their thinking? Um, I don't know uh, how much there's been, or I haven't come across a lot of uh, kind of specific talk about uh, the the NGO point. Um, but I think we've certainly seen them seeking to kind of uh, leverage development support wherever possible. Um, and certainly in terms of kind of uh, their good defence capabilities and, and their military, um, they're keen to leverage that role and the kind of credentials they have for having been quite uh, effective in, um, you know, tackling the kind of security issues uh, in their own country versus how their neighbours have been doing. Um, and to put themselves forward uh, on that basis and to kind of then use that uh, to get
get the support of uh, development partners. And, and that's something they, they very much did at the this G5 summit that we saw just a month ago uh, that was hosted in Nwakshot. So I, I would imagine that is um, something that is broadly uh, still very much that they're looking to do, particularly with, with the coronavirus uh, crisis. I think you know, they're, they're looking for any, any ways that they can um, to make sure that they, they do continue to receive donor support. Kim, hi, it's, it's William speaking in Invest in Africa. Um, is there, other than the obvious focus on oil and gas, is there other sectors that you're seeing actual energy and commitment being put behind? I mean, every government likes to list off you know, priority sectors, and there's normally more than they can really manage. Is there one or two others that you're seeing real energy and um, a focus on, please? Um, I think in terms of the rhetoric, uh, we hear a lot about this anti-poverty agenda um, and also on reforming the education system, which I'm sure Matt can speak to uh, much better than I can. Um, but I think with uh, more broadly, I can't I can't say any particular sector in that we have noticed. That said, we are uh, focused specifically on oil and gas, uh, so it could well be that uh, there's a movement that we're not aware of that there was a deal with Kinross and mining um, earlier this year. Uh, but my kind of overall sense is that the COVID-19 crisis has kind of sucked up a lot of government uh, resource and capacity and attention. Um, but others, yeah, others may have more insight on that. Yeah, Matt, um, uh, I, I've got, I'd just be interested in, in Kim, in, in your thoughts. It may be premature, but um, from your um, oil and gas client base, what uh, are you getting any, apart from the obvious ones, I guess, that we, we'd all predict from, from COVID and, and its impact on the uh, oil and gas prices, uh, are you seeing any um, any other reactions from your oil and gas client base in, in Mauritania? To, to, to the COVID crisis? Well, yeah, principally the, uh, the fall in energy prices that uh, COVID has, has driven. I mean, are you seeing anything in terms of investment um, plans, delays, levels of interest, um, people starting to consider alternative countries for opportunities, those, those kinds of um, um, Yeah, no, uh, a, a your question, a good question. Uh, not, not at this stage. I don't think, um, uh, I mean, clearly there's a lot of kind of cost-cutting pressures uh, across the board um, and uh, there is a focus on kind of exploration activities and, um, you know, that is also going to be facing uh, tighter budgets and, and things like that. Uh, I don't think it's something that we've uh, got the impression is already um, underway in terms of, you know, Mauritania being, uh, activity in Mauritania being delayed or, or kind of potentially cancelled. Obviously, there are some kind of operational constraints um, with some of our uh, clients unable to kind of be on the ground and, and getting on with some of their work. Um, and there have been some concerns about uh, kind of just basic things like government functioning if if the health situation gets a lot worse um but for the moment i, I we haven't kind of seen trickle down effects uh, very good to hear you uh, and um to i mean to a large extent to hear that your analysis chimes pretty much um, uh, with with mine uh with ours um so i really i don't think i have uh, a lot to add but i thought i would just perhaps pick up on one or two of the the outstanding questions that you uh you kind of posited for 2020-21 um just to share a little bit of speculation really um about some of those some of those issues um i mean the parliamentary inquiry obviously is is very much kind of top of the media agenda at the moment um even if it's not necessarily top of the agenda for for the vast uh, majority of the population, it does preoccupy the, the, the political and to some extent business elite, if those two things are distinguishable, um, uh, to a fair degree. Um, I'm beginning to hear a few suggestions um, that maybe we won't see it before the end of July. And if we don't, then does it have to wait for the, uh, for the uh, new session of parliament in October? Not necessarily, because the president does have the authority to summon an extraordinary session of parliament. But would he really want to do that in the middle of the summer holidays? I mean, all of this is is typical Mauritanian gossip and rumour. Um, 
merely because it hasn't yet appeared. Uh, I think it was originally expected in early July, then the 15th of July, um, and now it's, what are we, the 23rd? Um, so we've got a week, what, eight days, eight days to go. Um, I entirely agree with your analysis of the inquiry, um, but I just add one point that certainly a, I mean, yes, there's been a lot of denial, it wasn't me, or I was only acting on orders kind of defence, Nuremberg trial type defence. Um, by some of the people who've been summoned, but there's also also been some uh, accusations from those who uh, who've um, invited or, or questioned by the commission, or indeed in the media, that members of the commission themselves are not um, beyond criticism, um, and uh, that may also have something to do with the delay in its in its publication. I mean, the other thing we should remember is that. You know, regardless, even if the Commission does publish its report, you know, it doesn't have any judicial authority. Uh, so any prosecution would require the Ministry of Justice to conduct its own investigation. And indeed, the Parliament would also have to vote by two thirds of, uh, by, with a majority of two thirds, to set up a Supreme or High Court to hear the case, um, uh, specifically for a, a former president. So, um, you know, there's an awful, an awfully long road to travel before we get to the point of any real uh, judicial uh, activity. I've always felt to some extent that the commission was set up uh, as a little bit of a sword of Damocles to keep the former president um, quiet, as it were and others. And now, of course, at some point, the president does have to demonstrate that he's addressing the accusations of uh, uh, corruption, bribery, etc, etc. To what extent is that dangerous for him, given that he was, if not directly associated with it, nevertheless, a long term ally and associate of the former president, um, you know, and, and part of an administration that allowed that to, to, to occur. Um, so a lengthy judicial investigation might be a convenient way of kicking it into the long grass. I, I, as I say, I'm merely speculating here. Um, you, you raised the question around sort of social and ethnic questions and divisions. Um, and I think, you know, certainly my expectation was a year ago that if the new government didn't, was not seen to be responding to many of the social economic deficits, you know, there would be increasing noise and criticism. Now, although COVID has added to the challenges, in a way, I, was, I suspect it's also slightly distracted attention away from those other deficits. And the government has made, I would say, you know, reasonable attempts to, to respond at least to the very that the most disenfranchised and underprivileged in society, although it's probably only a really very small fraction of those who may lack access to water, electricity, education, jobs, etc. Um, but there have been in other areas, setting COVID aside for a moment, some positive developments. Again, legislation that hasn't yet necessarily worked its way through or been approved by Parliament, but draft legislation that's taken an awfully long time to, to, to get to this point, but has now been approved by the Council of Ministers on trafficking in persons, that was largely to address US concerns around slavery, on NGOs, on uh, violence against women. And these are things which, you know, had been sat in the in-tray for the last two or three years and have now made their way to Parliament. Of course, they face the usual angling in Parliament associated with this, some, some often sensitive issues, but there, ha there has been significant progress. On the broader kind of access or not access selection of of uh, advisors of ministers etc you know i've been hearing rumors of a reshuffle ever since the government was appointed on the 8th of august last year and there was a small one earlier in the year um uh, just after the african investment summit but you know vetter is still there uh, every week he is is identified as being for the chop and and the following week he's still there um now that's not to say that the parliamentary commission or other uh, other pressures might not force um, the president to, to undertake a reshuffle. And, and, and a lot of people expect that to be, I mean, I would have, if I were advising Gazwani, I'd have encouraged him to do it before the Parliamentary Commission publishes a report. So he seemed to be grasping the nettle rather than merely responding to criticism. 
Um, but that hasn't yet happened. Um, but the 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 the, the Fed, I think. We shouldn't ignore the fairly significant changes in the military and security apparatus leadership a month ago, um, which, to the extent that you know, I've, I've been able to dig into it, um, suggested, I think you alluded to this, but suggested he, there were a number of people who maybe didn't get the promotions he expected or he would have wanted them to get during, when he was chief of the armed forces and as easy in charge. And those people have been now put into significant positions and others gen gently eased out. Uh, the one group that perhaps has not received any largesse there are senior Harriton officers, um, which is you know, a perpetual problem. Um, for this audience, perhaps my last point is just about you know, foreign investment and, and whether the, that climate becomes easier, more difficult. Um, I'm not, I don't actually think it's changed a lot. Um, as you rightly suggested, Kim, you know, the, 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 the effect, the operational constraints and sort of government capacity were already obstacles of some sort. I don't think they've got any worse, uh, but they haven't improved either. I mean, there is there is and continues to be, I think, a short termism in the Mauritanian approach to foreign investment, and they, they tend not to look at the longer game. Um, I've made the point very directly to a number of ministers recently that in the more challenging commercial and economic environment to come, you know, Mauritania is going to have to make itself doubly attractive. Well, I can certainly um, echo the uh, short termism and uh, resting on their laurels, certainly with the uh, ministries of economy. Um, that's that's a that is a real thing. It's uh, resting on their laurels. <laughs> We, uh, Roger, do you want to uh, wrap up? If there's no more questions, Roger, do you want to um, wrap up then? And um... Thank you, Matt. Yes, uh, yes, I will. Um, let me um, thank everybody who's uh, joined this meeting. Um, we're all guinea pigs and groundbreakers in MBBC history in that this is the, uh, the first virtual event we've, uh, we've conducted. So we thank you all for um, participating. Um, thanks, of course, to... Uh, uh, to, to Kim and Critical Resource particularly, you know, as we as we sit here in um, various states of lockdown and, and various degrees of travel restrictions, it, it, it's sort of human nature almost to start to feel a bit kind of detached from uh, topics of interest. But uh, Kim, I think you've um, you, you brought us right back with a very um, very insightful. Um, summary of, of of the current situation in in mauritania and um that's that's brought it back to life for uh, for us on the call uh, i'm i'm sure um also like to uh thank uh, simon simon Boyden for joining from long distance uh, and um uh, sort of sharing his perspectives and, and helping us uh, ground truth things so uh many thanks indeed to uh you for that thanks also to the folk who've uh, raised questions and uh, contributed to the uh, to the discussion uh, lastly i would just uh, repeat what matt said at the outset that um, our next event is scheduled for the 15th of september it will be a virtual event uh, uh, and another mbbc member uh, in this instance petrofac will host it uh, and that will start at 10 a.m. UK time on the uh, 15th of September. So we look forward to your uh, participation in that one. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much. Stay safe and uh, in, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Kim, especially, yes. Thank, thank you, Kim. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Many thanks.